Coming up on Arirang News, Israel's aerial bombardment on Gaza continues on for more than a week in participation of a ground invasion. With the humanitarian crisis worsening, the international community raises concerns while Biden warns Israel not to occupy Gaza. For the very first time, South Korea's first homegrown supersonic fighter jet, the KF-21, is to be unveiled to the public. This with the latest military equipment at front and center at Northeast Asia's biggest ever defense exhibition, the Seoul ADEX 2023, taking place this week. South Korea's semiconductor exports saw improvement last month, hitting an all-time high for any month this year. The country's tech exports have been declining on year for a 15th consecutive month, but dropped by the smallest thanks to chips. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We start with the Israel-Hamas conflict in the Middle East, where international pressure is mounting for Israel to allow aid into the region amid what's becoming a deepening humanitarian crisis. Also, with an expected Israeli ground operation, U.S. President Joe Biden has warned Israel that occupying Gaza would be a big mistake. In the meantime, eyes are on the reopening of an Egyptian-controlled crossing for fleeing Palestinians. Yi Su-jin leads us off. The international community is mobilizing to minimize civilian casualties from the Israel-Hamas conflict as a ground war seems imminent. Although the Israeli military warned all civilians in the Gaza Strip on Friday local time to evacuate to the south ahead of a possible ground assault, concerns about a humanitarian crisis continue to grow as the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt remains closed. The Rafah border crossing is currently the only potential exit and means to receive supplies of fuel, electricity and water for most Palestinians in Gaza after Israel closed its two border crossings and imposed a complete siege on the territory. The United States has been urging Egypt to reopen the Rafah crossing, and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters in Cairo on Sunday that it soon will be, although he did not specify exactly when. Um, I had very good conversations both um, with the uh, Crown Prince in, in Saudi Arabia and here in Egypt with President al-Sisi and also heard I think a lot of good ideas about some of the things we need to do moving forward including practical ideas on getting assistance to Palestinians in Gaza who are in need. And U.S. President Joe Biden in a 60 Minutes interview with CBS on Sunday local time said that Israel had to respond to the Hamas attack but that it would be a big mistake for Israel to occupy Gaza. He also added that Israel will do everything in its power to avoid the killing of innocent civilians. Western officials have also privately been urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other senior officials to delay the ground attack to allow civilians to evacuate. They have also called for the nation to provide access to humanitarian aid as concerns about civilian deaths continue to mount, according to the Financial Times. Leaders of the Arab League and the African Union released a joint statement in which they urged Israel to reconsider the ground offensive as it could lead to a genocide of unprecedented proportions. The future of the displaced Palestinians remains uncertain even though the Egyptian-controlled Rafah crossing is expected to reopen as Cairo remains opposed to the resettlement in Egypt and because it will be difficult for them to return to their homes in Gaza once they have fled. Isujin, Arirang News. One of Northeast Asia's largest aerospace and defense exhibitions, dubbed Seoul ADEX 2023, kicks off tomorrow. From the country's first domestically produced supersonic fighter jet, the KF-21, to main battle tanks, visitors can get a glimpse of the latest military equipment. What's also worth noticing this time is an unusual landing of U.S. strategic bomber, the B-52. Our defense correspondent, Choi min -jung, has a preview. South Korea's first homegrown supersonic fighter jet, the KF-21, soars above Seoul Air Base. 
It's being revealed to the public for the very first time at the biennial Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, taking place from Tuesday to Sunday. This year's exhibition is the largest so far, with some 550 entities from 35 countries taking part. Spectators can get a rare up-close look at the country's latest military equipment, such as the F-35A stealth fighter jets and the F-A-50 light attack aircraft. Also on display is the country's main battle tank, the K-2 Black Panther, which shot to fame when Poland struck a deal to purchase 1,000 of them last year. And to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Seoul-Washington alliance this year, the U.S. has boosted its display of military power. Yes, the B-52 will conduct uh, one to two flybys of Seoul Airfield during Seoul ADEX. U.S. strategic bomber the B-52 is making an appearance as it is making a rare landing at a South Korean airbase this week. Also one of the key U.S. assets on display is the F-22 Raptor, known as the world's most powerful fighter jet. Seoul ADEX has been growing in size with every edition, with Korea looking to become one of the world's top four defense export countries. It's also striving to become one of the world's top air shows. We'll do our best to make Seoul ADEX, which will be held again in 2025, one of the world's top three air shows. Taking this as an opportunity to promote the country's advanced military and space technologies overseas, South Korea has invited senior-level military officials and delegations from 53 countries. The exhibition was first launched in 1996 to promote domestic defense firms and boost global technology exchanges. Choi min Arirang News. Just days after the U.S. claimed that North Korea delivered military equipment to Russia, South Korea and the United States have pledged to work more closely together. During a meeting held on Monday in Jakarta between South Korea's top nuclear envoy Kim Gon and his U.S. counterpart Song Kim, the two agreed to share information about additional military cooperation between North Korea and Russia and to respond firmly to North Korea's provocations, such as the expected launching of a spy satellite sometime in October. This comes after Washington said on Friday that North Korea sent Russia more than 1,000 containers of military equipment for use in the fighting in Ukraine. Meanwhile, North Korea state media KCNA also announced on Monday that Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will be visiting North Korea on Wednesday and Thursday this week, just a month after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's rare visit to Russia. This year's Seoul Defense Dialogue will be held from tomorrow until Thursday. Ministers from countries including Australia, Malaysia and Mongolia will participate in the event as well as hundreds of officials from 56 different countries. The officials will discuss the escalating North Korean nuclear threat and the changing dynamics of global security. The war in Ukraine as well as the recent Israel-Hamas conflict will likely be discussed at the event. Sources say the dialogue seeks peace on the Korean peninsula as well as promotes security cooperation in the region. The high-level multilateral meeting has been held by South Korea's defense ministry since 2012. South Korea's Foreign Minister Park Jin met with American Special Envoy on North Korean human rights issues Julie Turner on Monday in Seoul. Park said the appointment of the special envoy following a six-year vacancy is a significant step as it strengthens the foundation upon which Korea and the U.S. can together advance human rights in North Korea. Ambassador Turner, on her very first full day on the job since being sworn in on Friday, said the hum human rights situation in North Korea remains amongst the worst in the world and that the international community needs to work together to create concrete change. She'll stay in Seoul until Wednesday. During COVID-19, the South Korean government temporarily slashed taxes on fuel. The tax cuts were due to expire this month, but authorities have decided to extend them until the end of the year to better contain any potential ripple effects from the conflict in the Middle East on global oil prices. Moon hye has the details. South Korea will be extending its fuel tax cuts until the end of the year amid concerns regarding supply due to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian militant group Hamas. 
During an emergency economic meeting on Monday, Finance Minister Chu kyung ho stated that the government will prioritize people's livelihoods as the world grapples with economic uncertainties. We will be making all efforts to stabilize livelihoods and prices by focusing on the management of food and energy prices. The tax cuts, which were lowered to 25 percent for gasoline and 37 percent for diesel in January this year, were initially put in place to help curb inflationary pressure amid rising oil prices. This isn't the first time the government has given an extension. It was extended once back in April and then again in August. The most recent extension was set to expire at the end of this month amid a fall in the country's tax revenues, but the conflict between Israel and Hamas prompted Seoul to extend it further. Energy and supply chains could be at risk depending on how the conflict develops, and we cannot exclude the possibility of facing difficulties despite global inflation seemingly slowing. Bloomberg Economics also released a report last Friday forecasting an oil price hike of more than 64 U.S. dollars to $150 per barrel should the conflict develop into a war between Israel and Iran. Iran is not only a major source of oil, but it also controls the Strait of Hormuz, through which over a fifth of the world's oil is transported. If Iran blocks this route due to military engagement, a sharp rise in oil prices would be unavoidable. International oil prices surged by around 6 percent last Friday due to reports that Israeli ground forces were about to be deployed in the Gaza Strip. Chu said that the South Korean government will remain vigilant in order to respond as quickly as possible to any new situations that may arise. Moon hye Arirang News. South Korea's semiconductor exports saw improvement last month, hitting an all-time high for any month this year. The country's tech exports have been declining on year for a 15th consecutive month, but dropped by the smallest thanks to chips. An Songjin explains. As South Korea's tech exports in September reached 18.1 billion U.S. dollars, according to the Trade Ministry on Monday, the country saw a $7.3 billion trade surplus in ICT trade. Though still showing an on-year decline, Tech exports have improved from May, leading to the smallest on-year decline of the year, at 13.4 percent last month. This is mostly due to an improvement in the semiconductor industry, which saw its highest export value this year as inventories cleared out. With semiconductors having a relatively sluggish start to 2023, September's value of exports was the highest of the year so far. Semiconductor exports were still lower than for the same month in the year before, but that on-year decline has decreased to 14.4 percent with semiconductor exports standing at around 10 billion U.S. dollars, as memory and system semiconductors both improved. However, the weak prices of memory chips is slowing their recovery. Meanwhile, the export of displays was in the black for the second consecutive month as OLED exports increased. China takes up nearly half of South Korea's ICT exports, but exports to China were down 22 percent on-year. Exports to Europe in September decreased by 12.2 percent on-year, while exports to the U.S. also fell by 18.7 percent, even though exports of mobile phones saw an increase. ICT exports to Vietnam, meanwhile, saw an increase of 1.9 percent. Though there are slow signs of recovery in the tech industry, with an overall slowdown in the global economy, exports of mobile phones and computer devices continue to decrease. Han Songjin, Arirang News. Leaders from Asia-Pacific nations gathered this week in Korea to discuss how to envision digital and data cooperation. There, South Korea renewed its support for the establishment of a digital order and shared prosperity that's in tandem with what President Yoon has earlier laid out in New York. Our Yi shi has heard what the participants had to say. South Korea is doing its best to achieve shared prosperity in digital technology with countries around the world. That is according to Science Minister Lee jong ho at the Regional Consultation for the Asia-Pacific on the United Nations Global Digital Compact that kicked off in Seoul on Monday. South Korea supports the UN's establishment of principles of digital resources and will actively participate in the making of the order and solidarity of the international community. For two days beginning on Monday, government, business and academic leaders from 11 Asia-Pacific nations are discussing ways to envision digital and data cooperation. 
co-hosted by the South Korean government and the UN Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, the meeting provides a chance for the region to exchange their views on realizing a shared vision. So a consultation like the one today that's being hosted by the Republic of Korea is really important for countries to come around a table and really discuss how we can actually work together on leveraging the power of digital technologies for this, achieving the sustainable development goals. The consultation follows Seoul's commitment to establishing a digital order and principles as shared by President Yoon song yeol at the UN General Assembly last year. This year, the South Korean government published what it calls the Digital Bill of Rights. The Digital Bill of Rights presents five principles to achieve an exemplary society that people around the world should pursue. They are freedom, fairness, safety, innovation and solidarity. The Digital Bill of Rights lists specific principles based on six categories. They include ways to safeguard freedom, offer fair access, as well as promote innovation and human well-being. Meanwhile, the results of the consultation will be reflected in the UN Global Digital Compact, set to be signed at the Summit of the Future in September 2024. Lee Si-hoo, Arirang News. The 2023 Sustainable Development Transformation Forum commenced in Incheon, South Korea, on Monday. Hosted by the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development, around 100 participants from various sectors convened to discuss ways to reinforce the 2030 agenda. The 15-year plan developed by the UN in 2015 is designed to pursue its Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, to tackle major universal issues such as poverty and environmental concerns. Marking the midpoint of the 2030 agenda, this year's forum will center around eradicating poverty. The UN office established in 2011 is dedicated to implementing the SDGs, particularly for developing countries. In the city of Sejong, here in South Korea, there's a robot that patrols the streets autonomously, monitoring and detecting potential danger or the risk of fire. A system has been built where the information from the robot is sent to emergency workers to respond quickly. Yoon Jin tells us more. This four-legged robot approaches with its headlight on. It discovers a man collapsed on the ground and sends live video footage to a nearby device. This artificial intelligence robot is in charge of patrolling the Kumgang Pedestrian Bridge in Sejong City. It can climb stairs, avoid obstacles in its way, and even find a charging station on its own. A thermal camera and a 360-degree camera have been added to the robot to increase functionality for detecting dangerous situations, including fires. The goal is to build a system where these AI robots send live surveillance footage to the Urban Integrated Information Center from where the city's CCTV network is controlled so that firefighters and police can respond quickly to any situation. Existing robots were focused on mobility and autonomous walking, but we've added a function that uses AI data to detect abnormal behaviors like people collapsing and report incidents to the Urban Integrated Information Center. Patrol robots have been on trial in some communities, but this is the first time that they've been operated by a local government. Sejong City plans to run trial operations this year and introduce additional robots next year after adjusting for any shortcomings. Understanding it as robots doing things humans can't do or things that are difficult for humans, I think this will play a role in reinforcing human duties while promoting safety. A world where artificial intelligence robots patrol for the safety of humans is no longer an image of the future, but a reality right now. Yoon Jin, Arirang News. The track list for Golden has been unveiled the upcoming solo album by BTS member Jungkook. Big Hit Music revealed on Monday the track list of Jungkook's first solo album, which will be released next month with the lead of track Standing Next to You. The album includes the previously released digital single 7 and 3D, and all 11 tracks are composed with English lyrics. Standing Next to You once again features producers Andrew Wad and Zerkid, who earlier this summer produced Jungkook's successful solo debut 7. On the album, Jungkook has collaborated with many global musicians, including British singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran and Canadian singer-songwriter Shawn Mendes. 
DJ Snake, a French producer and rapper, also features on one of the tracks. Korea's southern port city of Busan has just released a song to support its bid to bring home the 23 World Expo. It's called Keep Going and features K-pop star Chu and the 2030 Busan Expo Global supporters. The song is up on Busan's official bid website and YouTube channel. Meanwhile, the host city of the 2030 World Expo will be chosen by BIE member states at the 173rd General Assembly on November 28th. Busan is up against Rome and Riyadh. Five sports have been attended to the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics. At the International Olympic Committee session held in Mumbai on Monday, Five sports including baseball and softball, squash, lacrosse, cricket and flag football proposed by the LA28 organizing committee were approved. Under IOC rules, each host city can propose the addition of several sports for their addition of the games. For baseball, LA28 will be the first time in seven years that the sport will be played at the Olympics as it will not be part of the 2024 Paris Games. The Chinese city Hangzhou, where the Asian Games recently came to a close and where the Asian Para Games will be held, means more than just sports for Korea. It's where Korean independence fighters found a new beginning by relocating the provincial government after facing tough times in Shanghai. Our cultural correspondent Song Yujin went there and files this report. Hangzhou, the host of the largest ever Asian Games, holds a special place in Korea's heart beyond the medals and records. Right next to the famous Xihu, or West Lake in Hangzhou, you'll find the Memorial Hall of the Korean Provisional Government. So originally, there were three Korean Provisional Government buildings here in the city of Hangzhou, but this is the only one that's left. So as you can see, this building, it was originally used by government officials until 1934, but now it's used as an exhibition hall. Open to the public since 2007, the Memorial Hall has two main sections, a recreation of the rooms used by the government and an exhibition hall that tells the story of the Korean Provisional Government's 27-year struggle for independence. The Korean Provisional Government was set up in 1919 in Shanghai after the March 1st independence movement. However, it had to relocate after independence activist Yun bong set off a bomb in Shanghai's Hongkou Park in 1932 that killed several high-ranking Japanese military officials. Fleeing from Japan's invasion of Shanghai, the Korean provisional government found refuge at an inn in Hangzhou in 1932. But due to budget constraints, they later moved their headquarters here to Hubian Village a year later. This two-story building served as both a home and a workplace for government officials. Records show that they stayed in Hubian until November 1934 before moving to their third and final headquarters in Hangzhou, Wufuli. The memorial's director says the three and a half years in Hangzhou were a crucial turning point for the Korean provisional government. It was during this period when Kim Gu, one of the founding members of the government, secretly met with then-Chinese leader Jiang Jieshi, where Jiang pledged to fund Korean independence fighters. Kim also established the Korean National Party, which united various scattered groups of independence activists. So, for those who want to step back in time and take a look at this history, the hall is open every day from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., free of charge. Song Yujin, Arirang News, Hangzhou. The pattern of chilly mornings and warm daytime conditions will prevail again. Most regions will see wide temperature gaps of more than 10 degrees Celsius. Some will see a difference of 12 degrees with lows starting off at 8 degrees Celsius. Other regions such as Gotang will see a bigger gap. Such drastic fluctuation in temperatures can make our bodies more vulnerable to viruses, so please take extra care of your health at this time. With temperatures plummeting overnight, most inland regions will see frost through the morning hours. Keep in mind the frost and freeze conditions could damage crops and other sensitive vegetation. For the east coast, high waves are in the forecast, along with gusty offshore winds. 
it is highly recommended to refrain from fishing or boating. Sunny skies will dominate tomorrow. Morning temperatures in Seoul and Daegu will be starting off at 8 degrees. As for the daily highs, Seoul will get up to 20 degrees. Daejeon and Gwangju 21. Busan will be topping out at 23 degrees. A low pressure system will spread showers for central regions on Thursday. That's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world. Well, that's all for this Monday Night Newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news. Hope everyone has a good start of the week.